Our topic is air resistance and friction. This also means we get more practice with F equals MA and free body diagrams. Never a bad thing. First problem, a box of mass M equals 5.2 G, not G, kg, kilograms, sits on the ground. Always, always draw the pictures. There is the ground, there is the box. M is 5.2 kilograms for this box. There's only one box, so we only need one M. The coefficient of static friction between the box and the ground is 0.55, while the coefficient of kinetic friction is 0.4. All right, first question, how hard with what force must you push on the box in order to get it moving? Well, so the idea is, is that I'm gonna bring my hand in here, I'm gonna push this way. So let's draw a free body diagram for the box. There is gravity downwards. There is definitely going to be a normal force up as the ground pushes back up on the box. We've got the force of my hand. This is a compression interaction. It is a normal force, but I'm gonna call it F push. That's the one we wanna figure out. And then what, res what is resisting it actually being pushed? Well, we have a, the force of static friction. That is our free body diagram. So what do we know about static friction? Well, static friction is limited. We know that the magnitude of static friction has to be less than or equal to the coefficient of static friction times the normal force between the same two things that are the, the, the friction forces between. So that's the ground and the box in this case. Well, what is that normal force? Well, I see the normal force is entirely in the y direction. We know that AX is zero and AY is zero. I should probably define my axes before I really start talking about X and Y. Because the whole the thing is at rest and it's staying at rest. And so if its velocity isn't changing, its accelerations are zero. So if we look in the Y direction, MAY is equal to FN minus FG, because the magnitude of gravity well, gravity is all in the y, minus y direction, so it's, that's the y component of gravity is minus the magnitude of gravity, and that has to equal zero, so Fn is just equal to mg. Hey, that's nice. So down here, the force of static friction must be less than or equal to, if you have static friction, mu s mg. So that is in order for it to stay still. Our goal is actually to get it moving. So if we want to get it moving, then um, we need to exert a force. Well, let's talk about the x direction first before we, maybe it's obvious, but just in case it's not. We will say that in the x direction, max, x is that way. Um, so actually FSF is in the positive x direction, minus F push. So if it gets moving, it will have an acceleration in the negative direction. That's great. So that is, uh, that says if MAX is zero, then FSF is equal to F push. So the condition for it saying still is F push is less than or equal to mu s mg. That's the condition for it to stay still. So the condition to get it moving is F push has to be greater than mu s mg, right? So which says that F push has to be greater than 0.55 times 5.2 kilograms. The coefficient of static friction is unitless times 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, stick that in my calculator. Okay, and the result is F push has to be greater than 28.028 newtons, which is too many sig figs. So I'm going to write over here, A, F push has to be greater than 28 newtons. So that's the answer to part A. Now in part B, we ask, if you push at this with this force, with the force you need just to overcome 
static friction, at what rate does the box accelerate? Well, we have the same free body diagram because we have F push, normal force this, except now instead of static friction, this becomes kinetic friction and we know that kinetic friction is equal to mu k Fn, all right? So knowing that, now we can work out the same thing. Um, this still applies because Ay is still zero, so this still applies, but I need to do Ax over, it's almost the same, Max as before. In the plus x direction we have kinetic friction, in the minus x direction we have F push. So Fkf minus F push. That is equal to mu kmg, which we know from here. Well, the normal force we know from that, and we know that from there, minus F push. So Ax is equal to mu kg minus F push over M. And we have all those numbers, so let's go ahead and put them in. Mu k is 0 0.40, g is 9.8 meters per second squared. F push, I'm going to put in 28, but this is an intermediate calculation, so I'm going to put in extra digits, and this problem doesn't really matter, but it's a good habit to be in. Newtons divided by 5.2 kilograms. And that being done, I can now put this into my calculator, and I get AX is equal to, so we have two sig figs here, and that thing would have come out to the tenths place. We have two sig figs here, so it would have come out to the tenth place. So we, to the right number of sig figs, Ax is equal to minus 1.5 meters per second squared. So the question was, at what rate does it accelerate? So I'm looking just for the magnitude of the acceleration. This just says it's going to go in the minus x direction because that's the direction I'm pushing it. So B, the magnitude of the acceleration is 1.5 meters per second squared. That's the answer to part B. So you try to push, you increase and increase until you're pushing it just enough and it starts to shoot away, accelerating away from you at 1.5 meters per second squared. Boo! Off it goes. That's assuming you keep your hand in contact and keep pushing. If you stop pushing, then it'll start to slow down again because of the kinetic friction. All right, that is the first problem. For the second problem, assume that a box falling through air has a drag coefficient CD equals 1. Here is a box. I'm going to draw it all 3D and stuff. In fact, anticipating what it looks like, I'm going to draw it like this. All right, there is a box. It is falling through the air. Consider a box that is W by W by 2W in size. Now you see why I drew it this way. So that dimension is W, that dimension is W, and this dimension is 2W. All right, that's the size of the box. It falls with the small, if it falls with a small side downward, how does its terminal velocity compare to when it falls with one of the larger sides downward? So basically what I want to do is find the terminal velocity here. Again, horribly named, it's a terminal speed, not a terminal velocity, but oh well. And compare it to what happens when it falls like this. In fact, here, I'll just write it like this. I'll make this V term, V term. Uh, two, we'll call this V term one. How do the two compare to each other? Well, okay. So what we're going to do is I'll draw the I'll draw in this case, knowing that the equations are going to be the same in the other. So we have the box. It has gravity downwards, and it has the drag force upwards of air resistance. And the terminal velocity will happen when the drag force is equal to gravity. Um, Everything's in the y direction, or whichever is up and down. So I'm not going to worry about the vectors here. I'm just dealing with these two components. When that equals that, there will be no acceleration. It will be at terminal velocity. And remember, drag is 1 half rho v squared a c d. I probably didn't have them in that order before, but those are all the factors that are there. It has to equal mg. So the terminal velocity, well, multiply both sides by 2. Divide both sides by rho. Divide both sides by A, divide both sides by CD, and that would have been V squared, so I'm going to take the square root of both sides. All right, that's what the terminal velocity is. Now, if you think about it, what is different between these two cases? Well, 
They both have the same mass because they're the same box. They both have the same gravity because they're both falling on Earth. They have the same CD because I told you just assume CD equals one. Hand wave a little bit. They have the same rho because they're falling through the same air. The only thing that's different is A. Well, okay. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say that V term one divided by V term two is equal to, and I'm going to put this in for V term one. Doop. 2mg over rho a1 because that's different. So I have to give it a subscript and put in for v term 2, 2mg divided by rho a2 cd. So all I've done is I said, all right, I know what the terminal velocity is in general. The cross sectional area is different in these two cases. So in this case, the air is coming at it this, the cross sectional area is going to be this little end of the box. In this case, the air is coming at this, the cross-sectional area is going to be bigger. What are these two cross-sectional areas? Let's actually work that out. It's not very hard. The cross-sectional area, if you imagine looking at this from below, it looks like this. WWA1 is equal to W squared. If you imagine looking at the bottom of this, it looks like this, 2W by W. So the cross-section, this is the cross-sectional area, the area that the wind sees in a sense coming up like this. We're going to have A2 is equal to 2W squared because it's 2W times W. All right, so we know what to do with these A1 and A2, but before, all right, so I've got that, but before I do that, I want to simplify this expression. When you have fractions of fractions, first of all, if it's a square root of a square root, I can put the whole thing under one square root. And I have this, which I'm just going to copy over, 2mg over rho a1cd. And then this is a whole fraction in the denominator. So basically what I can do is multiply the by the bottom and the top by this. Because you can always multiply the bottom and the top by the same thing. Right? So everything cancels. Yay, no more denominator. And so now I have all this on the top. Rho A2 CD divided by 2 MG. And now a whole bunch of stuff cancels. 2 cancels 2. M cancels M. G cancels G. Rho cancels Rho. CD cancels CD. It's just the square root of A2 over A1. See why I didn't plug in numbers at the beginning? I didn't need to know any of the numbers. And A2 is 2W squared and a1 is w squared, so it's root two. That's your answer, is the ratio of the terminal velocity in case one to the terminal velocity in case two. So let's think about this to make sure it makes sense. Yes, when it's coming down, it's a little more streamlined like this because there's not as much area for the resisting air to push up against. It will actually be able to reach a faster velocity falling, 40% faster because root two is about 1.4, that in this case where it's falling more flat. Right? So I encourage you to, to take your eraser and go to the top of a tall building and drop it. Now keeping it from tumbling while it's falling is really hard, but drop it in a few different directions and well, yeah, whatever. Get, get a wind tunnel, build a wind tunnel. Uh, a great, ex never mind, let's, let's do the next problem. How about that? Problem three should sound familiar because it starts out exactly like a problem from two videos ago. A flatbed truck starts at rest with a crate sitting on its flat bed. So here I go, I'm gonna draw it. There's the truck, there's the wheels, there's the crate. It's at rest. The truck starts to accelerate. So I'll say we've got an acceleration that way. But the driver is really stepping on the gas and has added a turbocharger to the truck. So the truck accelerates to a rate of 0.4 G. Although in class, you guys were telling me about these drag cars that accelerate at G, I guess. Or, oh my goodness, I'm just crazy. Um, Passers by watch in shock. <sighs> okay. Hey, draw a free body diagram for the crate. Let's do that. Here is the crate. The crate um, has gravity that way and a normal force of the truck bed that way. And now we have to think about what's happening here. Um, the truck bed is accelerating this way, and so friction is going to oppose the relative motion of the crate relative to the truck bed. Well, the 
crate's moving this way, it's going to try and pull, or sorry, the truck bed's moving this way, it's going to try and pull the crate with it. The crate is, um, relative to the truck bed, would be moving backwards, so friction's going to oppose that. So friction is going to go this way. So that's what we have. In fact, I'm not going to call it static friction yet because we don't know if it's static or kinetic. I'm just going to call it the force of friction. Okay, that's part A. Draw free body diagram. I won't always say that, but when you're doing forces, you always want to draw a free body diagram. Part B. The coefficient of static friction between the crate and the truck is mu equals 0.35. Will the crate stay put as the truck accelerates? If it does, skip the next three parts. I'm going to use the professor psychology theorem that says that, well, he wants me to do these other three parts, so no, it won't accelerate. We can do better than that, though. Let's, let's figure out, is static friction good enough? Well, you know that static friction needs to be less than or equal to mu s times the normal force. So let's figure out, well, first of all, if the crate stays with the truck, then the crate has to have an acceleration in the x direction of 0.4 g. We'll define x that way and y that way. So for the crate to stay with the truck, it has to have the same acceleration as the truck. Okay, so that's what we need. Well, what is the x acceleration? <laughs> it is just the force of static friction. Well, okay, so we know that to stay with the truck, we have to have max is less than or equal to mu s fn. But what is fn? Well, you know that ay, I'll say may has to equal zero because ay is zero. And in the plus y direction, we have fn. In the minus y direction, we have fg, which is mg. So in this case, fn is equal to mg. So I can pull this down here and I can say that max has to be less than or equal to mu s times mg. I can divide both sides by m. And so therefore, ax must be less than or equal to mu s times g right? for this to work. So let's put the numbers in. Is 0.4g less than or equal to mu s is 0.35g. Notice I don't even have to put in g to do this. No! 0.4 is not less than 0.35, so therefore the answer to B is it will not stay still because this inequality doesn't work. All right, this is the inequality we need if for static friction to supply the force that's needed. To stay still, static friction needs to be equal to MAX. Okay. Well, so MAX has to be less than this, so that sets a limit on how much acceleration you can get, and we have figured out static friction is not good enough to hold this guy still. So therefore, the crate's going to start sliding back on the truck. So let's analyze it with kinetic friction, because that's what it tells us to do in part C. The coefficient of kinetic friction between the crate and the truck is 0.2. What is the acceleration of the crate? We have the same free body diagram. We know again, in fact, I'll start with this. MAY has to equal zero, because the crate there's nothing to make the crate go up or down. You know, eventually they will when it falls off the back of the truck, but as long as it's on the truck, it's not going to go up or down. So that's equal to Fn, which is in the plus y direction. Gravity's magnitude is mg. It's in the minus y direction. So therefore, we know Fn equals mg. Why did I do that? Well, because I know I'm going to need it. In the x direction, max is equal to, we only have one force, Ff. And it's kinetic friction, so we know it's equal to mu k times Fn, and we know that Fn is equal to mu k times mg. So we have max is equal to mu k mg. You can divide both sides by m. We are left with ax is equal to mu k times g. So the acceleration of the crate is 0.20 g. That's actually good enough. g is you can use as a unit of acceleration. If you wanted to also have this in meters per second squared, you could, of course, do that, and you would get uh, uh, it's 1.96 meters per second squared, except that we only have two sig figs, so we'd say 2.0 meters per second squared. But I'm going to leave it as 0.20g, because that's a fine unit for acceleration. I'll remember this, because I might need it later. 
All right, if the crate starts 1.5 meters from the back of the truck, how long will it be before the crate falls off the truck? Now, this one requires some thinking, and it's not thinking that we've worked through before in this class, although you could figure it out. So I'm going to bear in mind that A of the truck is that way, A of the crate is less, so I'll say A sub C is equal to 0.2 G. So knowing those two things, we can figure out when the crate falls off the back of the truck. The other thing we need, of course, is that the crate starts 1.5 meters from the back of the truck. So, all right, how do you do this kind of thing? Well, so if you think about it, as time goes on, the truck is going to pull ahead of the crate because the truck's accelerating at a faster rate. And so, what do I ask? It's, it's uh, how long will it be before the crate falls off the truck? So I want to figure out what is the time when the crate's position, so I'll call that X sub C, um, as compared to the truck's position. Now here's what, all right, where on the truck do I want to pick? I'm going to pick this as the place to call the position of the truck, right? Because if I pick that as the reference point to measure the truck, think about in the lab when you have those little carts, right? Do you look, read the beginning, the back, the middle? Well, just pick one and be consistent. If I pick this point, I can say that the initial position of the crate is zero, and the initial position of the truck is zero, and that's kind of convenient. What I want is x sub t and x sub c. I want x sub t to equal x sub t minus 1.5 meters. That is the condition. When the position of the crate is x sub t minus 1.5 meters, that is the condition for the crate to fall off the back of the truck. The truck is pulled 1.5 meters ahead of the crate. Well, these are both constant accelerations, so I know that x sub c is equal to x sub c zero, which is zero, plus v sub c zero t, which is zero, plus one half times the acceleration of the crate in the x direction, times t squared. That's very exciting. The x position of the truck is x sub t zero, which is zero, plus v t zero, the initial velocity of the truck in the x direction, which is zero, plus one half a sub t, t squared, okay? I'm gonna define a variable for this 1.5 meters, I'm gonna call delta x, so I don't have to have numbers in yet. All right, and so now I have, I want x sub c equals x sub t minus delta x, x sub c is 1 half a c t squared, x t is 1 half a t t squared. These are the same t's because I'm asking what is the time where this condition is satisfied. So that's when it, the time when the crate's position and the truck's position are different by delta x. Good, so I know this, so I need, just need to solve this for time. So if I subtract 1 half a c t squared minus 1 half a t t squared has to equal minus delta x. So I factor out AC minus AT over 2, T squared is equal to minus delta X, or T is equal to 2 minus 2 delta X divided by AC minus AT, which is the same as 2 delta X divided by AT minus AC. This I can now calculate and I didn't manage the board very well, so what I'll do is I will go up here to calculate it. So the time I get is equal to the square root of two times 1.5 meters times, now AT minus AC is 0.4 minus 0.2 times G, so it's 0.4 minus 0.2 times 9.8 meters per second squared. If I think about units, meters cancel meter, I have second squared in the denominator of the denominator, which will put second squared in the numerator. It's under a square root. I get seconds, that's what I want. So now I can plug in and figure out this time. All right, and I get 1.24 seconds. So the truck takes off, and just a second and a quarter later, the crate falls off the back. And the uh, driver says, oh, I guess I should not have stepped so hard on the gas because that crate had the lost Ark of the Covenant in it, and now I have destroyed it, and all the dust is going to come out, and our faces are going to melt. Important safety tip. So, there you go. That's the amount of time. Um, how fast will the crate be moving relative to the ground when it falls off the truck? How fast will it be moving relative to the truck? 
All right, the first question is the easier question. I want to save this t equals 1.24 seconds. I want to give myself extra sig fig, so 1.2372 seconds is what we had. Really, the answer to this, I only had two sig figs, would have been t equals 1.2 seconds. So now let's think about what is the speed of the crate relative, or just relative to the ground. So I'm asking, so the crate will be moving at some speed and the truck will be moving at some faster speed. We know that the speed of the crate is equal to the initial speed of the crate in the x direction. This is all x components here we're doing plus the acceleration of the crate times t, so that's pretty easy. That's going to be 0.2 g, which is the acceleration of the crate, times the time when it falls off the back, which is 1.2372 seconds. So that speed works out to be, all right, that speed works out to be not very fast. 2.42 five to too many sig figs meters per second. So the answer would be 2.4 meters per second. So that's gonna be something like five or six miles per hour. So the crate actually falls off so fast that it doesn't get to be going very fast. What is the speed of the crate relative to the truck? Well, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna calculate the speed of the truck or the X component of velocity of the truck. So this is also the X component of velocity of the truck because it's moving in the plus X direction. Truck is the same thing, it's VT zero, which is zero, plus the acceleration of the truck times time. So that's going to be 0.4 times 9.8 meters per second squared, times 1.2372 seconds. All right, I can put this in my calculator, although I'm going to notice that it's exactly twice, the only difference is this number, twice what that is. So I'm just gonna multiply this by two and I get 4.8498 meters per second. So the speed of the truck is that. What is the speed of the crate relative to the speed of the truck? What that means is from the point of view of the truck, things are happening. First of all, here's a tree by the side of the road and it's moving that way with speed VT. Also, the crate is sliding off the back of the truck, but not as fast. Well, so the speed of this relative to the speed of that, if they're all in the same direction, I can figure out the speed of the crate relative to the truck just by subtracting off, or not the speed, but really this is the x component of the velocity, by subtracting off the x component of the velocity of the truck. And so what I will get is um, 2.425 meters per second minus 4.850 meters per second, which is going to be equal to minus 2.4 meters per second, right? So that says that the truck, the, the crate, because the truck's moving twice as fast as the crate, the speed of the crate relative to the truck is minus 2.4 meters per second. So the truck driver looks back and he sees this crate moving away from him at a little more than five miles per hour. So uh -oh. gone. All right, that's all we've got this week. I think this is kind of a shorter video, but I'll see when I actually put it all together if it comes out to less than 30 minutes. You know, they tend to be 30 to 45 minutes. That's what we've got for this week friction and air resistance. Uh, we will probably see more of these problems when we get to the dynamics review. But soon, torque. Have fun, everybody.